Hey guys, I'm John and welcome to Respect Your Intellect. Are you curious to know when we'll be able to bioengineer superhumans with extremely strong bones, much greater lung capacity and incredible disease resistance? Or even choose aesthetic traits for your children like having blue eyes, being tall, not be susceptible to baldness, have perfect vision and have a high IQ? Well, in the last few years we made one of the most significant advances in gene editing that will literally change the world and make all this possible. This technology is called CRISPR-Cas9 as well as a newer version version called CRISPR-CPF1. What this technology does is that it lets us edit DNA just about as easily as doing a search and replace in a text editor on the computer. So stay with me to see how this technology works. Let's get started. Before we get into how it all works, let's talk about the different parts that are involved. Let's start by talking about CRISPR. CRISPR is a family of natural DNA sequences that can be found in bacteria and other single-celled microorganisms, and it serves as an immune system. CRISPR is actually an acronym that stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeat. Now that's quite the mouthful, so let's break it down so we can understand how it works. What's important to remember from this long name is the interspaced palindrome. Palindromes are sequences of letters that can be read the same left to right as right to left, like evil olive. In DNA and RNA, sequences of palindromes like this with spacers allows the folding on itself to create a sort of hairpin shape. We also know that these palindromes are interspaced, so what's in between? Well, we call it spacer DNA, which is essentially normal DNA, but we discovered that they match perfectly with viruses that previously infected the bacteria. This means that the spacer DNA is actually virus DNA that was kept in the bacteria's DNA as a form of acquired immunity. In other words, the spacers are like the natural vaccines that protect the bacteria against future infection. Another thing about CRISPR is that there's always a few genes right near it. These genes are called CRISPR-associated genes, but we mostly always shorten them to CAS. Cas genes are responsible for making proteins that make the CRISPR system work. Cas1, for example, is responsible for taking a snapshot of a virus and saving it as a new spacer to protect against future infections. Cas9, on the other hand, is a protein that cuts DNA like scissors in a precise location if it finds DNA that matches its guide. So now that we know how it works, how do we actually use CRISPR to our advantage? Well, the first thing we need to do is synthesize some guide RNA in a lab. This guide RNA is made up of transactivating CRISPR RNA and CRISPR RNA and acts like the coordinates of exactly where to cut the DNA when it finds it. Once the guide RNA is synthesized, we attach it to a Cas9 protein and inject it in the host. This protein will then make its way, find the exact location of the DNA to perform a cut and it'll cut in the same way that it would deactivate a virus. At that point, that gene is deactivated and the cell is going to try to fix it by doing insertions and deletions which will create mutations. But instead of letting the cell blindly repair the gene, we can insert whatever we want at the cut site by supplying a repair template. So we can choose to turn off a gene completely, add an entirely new one, simply fix a problem, or a combination of these to modify a gene. Even more recently, we discovered that there was another protein called CPF1 that we can use instead of Cas9 that comes with four main advantages. The first advantage is that CPF1 only requires CRISPR RNA, while Cas9 requires transactivating CRISPR RNA and CRISPR RNA. That makes CPF1 cheaper and faster to synthesize, easier to deliver because of its small size and generally more efficient due to its simplicity. The second advantage is that CPF1 cuts with an offset that results in a staggered cut, while Cas9 cuts like scissors and leaves blunt ends. With the blunt ends that Cas9 leaves, the cell often inserts mutations as it repairs the DNA strand. So the staggered cut from CPF1 will allow us to minimize mutations and be much more efficient and precise when we insert DNA at the cut site. The third advantage is that CPF1 cuts further away from the recognition site than Cas9 does. When Cas9 cuts a blunt end very near the sequence of DNA that we searched for and matched with, 
The mutations that can occur during repair might prevent us from making future cuts there. Since CPF1 cuts further away from the recognition site, it stays intact and can be used again and again for multiple cuts at that site if necessary. And the fourth advantage is that CPF1 has more flexibility with choosing target sites than Cas9 does. So CPF1 is looking to be an upgrade to Cas9, but even just being able to use both will give us a much larger range of possibilities. So how can we use this technology and why is it so significant? Well, DNA is the code that makes up every living thing that we know of, so being able to modify it means there's an insane amount of possibilities. We could engineer trees to make bigger fruits, we could make more resistant crops to minimize spoilage and waste, we could make malaria resistant mosquitoes, we could modify cancer cells to be targetable and treatable by drugs, we could fix hereditary diseases, we could make any living thing disease resistant, we could remove antibiotic resistance to make antibiotics effective again, we could fix radiation damage, and the list goes on and on and on. As of now, the majority of the world still imposes some limits on what they allow their scientists to do with the CRISPR-Cas9 or CRISPR-CPF1 technologies. There's a huge distinction in the scientific community between editing somatic cells and germline cells. Somatic cells are the cells in the body that have already differentiated themselves to become a particular particular type of cell, like blood cells, lung cells, liver cells, and so on. Germline cells, on the other hand, involve a sperm, an egg, or a fertilized embryo, so alterations of germline cells will be replicated and passed on to the descendants of that line. Somatic engineering is the only type that's considered acceptable at the moment because it only alters the function of a body part, rather than editing the person as a whole and all of their future descendants. Germline edits are generally known as CRISPR babies, so you may have already heard that term. There's a biophysics researcher named Hei Jiankui that altered human embryos to make them immune to HIV. This caused a pretty big uproar in the scientific community because there seems to have been very little oversight on his experiment. Furthermore, his Lone Ranger attitude here will impact these babies and potentially all the descendants of that line as well. His intentions were probably good considering that it's a HIV immunity he gave the embryos, but the implications here are too great to just dive in without thinking. We're getting better at identifying genes and performing modifications, but we're still far from masters at it. We still need to figure out even better ways of delivering the technology into the cells. We still need to ensure that the only cuts that will happen are the ones we want with no unintended side effects. We also still need to optimize how to best supply the repair template for the cells to use as repair material after the cut. So we need Need to wait until we have more testing done and more information in general before we start actually introducing DNA changes in the human population that will spread. On a lighter note, there's already been some changes made in DNA of somatic cells that are showing great results. There are trials going on right now to try and cure cancer. HIV DNA was cut and disabled successfully in cells it was infecting. Huntington's disease was successfully treated when engineered into mice, and the mice's brain began to heal which allowed them to regain their motor control, balance, and grip strength. As far as mice go, we also identified the gene that's responsible for the color of their coat, and we can use CRISPR to control it. Other than that, they're perfectly normal mice. Then there's human trials that are currently happening to treat inherited blindness in newborns. More efforts are currently happening to make mosquitoes malaria resistant or to reduce their population by lowering female fertility. Many more efforts are happening for crops to reduce wastage and spoilage in different ways. Studies are also currently happening on human embryos to remove disease-causing mutations, but they're not being implanted yet. There are also CRISPR kits that are being sold for at-home use and people can just start cutting away at bacteria DNA for about $150. And there's probably a lot more also happening that I'm not even aware of. On the research front, there are also other very important studies happening. One is that for the first time we can ensure that an offspring will carry a certain gene. This is called a gene drive. Now this is very significant because it would allow us to make global changes that spread until the entire population has the desired gene. One example is for the malaria-resistant mosquito. The way they do this is that instead of just editing the genome for one mosquito to have the malaria-resistant gene, they also
also copy the CRISPR technology directly in the germline cells. So instead of an offspring having a natural 50% chance of getting the malaria resistant gene from the parent that has it, the offspring is ensured to inherit it. They tested this with two mosquitoes that had the malaria resistant gene and red eyes. With 30 normal white-eyed mosquitoes and after only two generations their 3800 offspring all had red eyes and were malaria resistant. This technology could also be used on species that push many other species to the brink of extinction to ensure they only have male offsprings. This would restore an equilibrium and allow hundreds of species to flourish once again rather than go extinct. Obviously this sort of thing raises a lot of ethical questions but it'll still be a possibility that that we can consider. It's worth noting that gene drives have a bigger effect on populations that reproduce quickly like mosquitoes. In populations like humans, elephants or whales, the gene drives would spread pretty slowly and we'd have time to fix it before it annihilates us. You should also know that in 2015, Jennifer Doudna, who co-created this technology, asked for a global pause on the development of CRISPR-Cas9. This was because things were proving to be so successful that the development was advancing too quickly and there hadn't really been a discussion about all the implications of this technology. So this global pause that lasted a couple of months was so that everyone could take a minute to consider the consequences intended or unintended, as well as hearing all the different points of view on the morality and ethics of it all. It's also important to talk about having the right precautions, especially in the case of gene drives, because an accidental release could potentially change an entire species forever. It could actually even cross species if some closely related species breed together. So if there was an accidental release of a gene drive that ensures that only male offspring can be had, then those entire species could go extinct. So what do you think of this technology? Let me know in the comments what you would like to see the most from this technology and what scares you as well as where you stand on the ethics of all of this. I'd love to get an idea of where you guys stand generally when it comes to gene editing. If you like this video and want more, just hit that subscribe button. You can also hit the like button to help me out or share this with your friends or social media to help spread the information and get even more people involved in the discussion. You can also find links to my Twitter and Facebook in the description if you want to chat with me there. Until next time, thanks for watching and remember, respect your intellect.